and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us from Wild Hag Publishing, the current developer of the up of the upcoming Shadow Quest role-playing game, the one and only Deacon Bennett. How you doing today, man? I'm doing quite well. I really like the introduction. It kind of fits my Wild Hag name I got going on here, so I like it. Mm -hmm. So, oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. So, a bit of a tradition around here is opening up with the humble beginning, in a sense. So, with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Ooh, role-playing games. See, when I hear role-playing games, I think I go all the way back to late 80s, early 90s, uh, sitting in my basement of my parents' house and playing Japanese role-playing games, Final Fantasy, <laughs> Breath of Fire. That was my first experience with RPGs. Um, I learned how, I, was, I like to argue I learned how to read uh, from playing role-playing games. But in terms of tabletop role-playing games, I transitioned from video games to Dungeons & Dragons 3.5. So I'm on, I'm a young one of 38, so that was my first foray into tabletop role-playing games, was Dungeons & Dragons 3.5, the number crunch. Um, and I've done some other things from there, but D&D uh, &D has always kind of had a special place in my heart. Mm -hmm. So, now with the, with that said, would you, do you consider, did you um, stick largely to D&D 3.5 over the years, or did you jump around between systems? I really liked the amount of books of 3.5. It was kind of overwhelming, but it but how much I was able to dive into things and how much it did, like, prestige classes. I was always fascinated by that. But um, then again, I was also overwhelmed by the number crunch of it. And once 4th edition came out, uh, I was kind of drawn to that. But then I felt like they were just doing an MMO version of <laughs> Touches the Dragons. Yeah, that I, was hear, the... I hear that a lot, and it it's never that's never really stuck with me. Well... That was my impression mm -hmm. immediately. Um, I never even heard that argument. That was literally just the vibe I got from it. And it never really spoke to me um, very much. Uh, I could see how it would to certain people, especially people who really enjoy certain kinds of aspects of D&D. &D. Um, but then when 5th edition came out, I don't know when that was, 13, 14? Um, 13. That one, th was it 13? Okay. That one really spoke to what I enjoyed about D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of pulled me back in, in terms of types of role playing. But I had played uh, World of Darkness, um, some vampire, uh, some other things, and other things that we just kind of did on our own in my group, and some other groups. Mm -hmm. But D and D has always been kind of it for me. Yeah, and part of the reason I s I say that is the core mechanic that you're go that you're going with is. Definitely not the definitely not the standard affair because you're using a two d ten approach instead mm -hmm. of d twenty. Was was it because of bell curve? Was it because of something else that you went with two d ten when developing um, Shadow Quest? It's a great question. I actually hate the d twenty. I I don't understand it. <laughs> Every time I roll it, I just go, "What is happening here?" Because it doesn't seem like the numbers. Uh, correlate to skill as much as they do randomness. Like I, th I think a two d ten. What? Well, Shadow Quest has a one d ten, two d ten kind of rolling system. So it kind of keeps things in line with whether you're capable or incapable. And there's just only there's. I, I see less RNG involved, less randomness involved with it. Because um, with a two d ten, it kind of gravitates and pools closer to the ten. Whereas, you know, 1d20 kind of goes all over the place. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the, the, uh, the philosophy behind that, 
is I like 2D, I like a, a 1D20, the D20 system in some ways. Um, and, but I really enjoyed the idea of, well, what if you're not trained in something so you can, tr you can try to do something, but your chance of failure is great, right? With a 1D10, you have a 10% chance of failure, 10% chance of a critical failure or critical success, or not a critical success, a critical failure, but you have, you know, a chance of doing something. Whereas with a 2D10, you have a, um, you know, a, 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 if you roll a snake eyes, that's when you would have a critical failure. So that's a pretty low chance. And you have less of a chance of a critical success, but that kind of makes it all the more exciting, I think. So mm -hmm. that was kind of went into that is basically the number crunching. But also I liked the division between an untrained ability and a trained ability and how the dice could reflect that. Yeah, was was it a case where you were house ruling say f five E or three or three point five, and then the house rules just evolved into its own game, or was there a different path to the origin of Shadow Quest? Um, it was. Uh, it really came from my own just looking at the numbers. Every time I'd roll a one d twenty, I felt like it was feeling very random. It didn't feel like it reflected my character, and that plus five didn't seem to do very much, right? Like, if you roll a five, why is my amazing stealther just as good as the other person who isn't an amazing stealther, but they managed to get a 15 instead of a five? It just cre seemed to create a lot of randomness. Um, so that's what I didn't like about it. And then uh, we d I did do some homebrew, and let let's try to table rule some things and adjust it and I, I really liked it i enjoyed it a lot it the number seemed to reflect competency of characters a little bit better um definitely chance of failure definitely chance of significant success but it, it didn't feel like it was as random i can i can certainly see i can certainly see that now with the, with that in mind uh, one of the big, obviously, one of the big things is the quests that are associated with the classes. But I want to talk a bit on the class system since, just looking at the character sheet, you're, you're um having it. You're having a setup where it seems like you're doing, uh, multi-classing. Is this a is this a case where multi-classing mm -hmm. is very easy compared to the more ubiquitous fantasy games? Yes, I actually think uh, multi-classing is kind of a core part of the game, and it's kind of encouraged. Um, and p part of the reason for that is because of the Shadow Quest system. But uh, I think the classes, definitely, I want to have some flavor in the classes, and there are some flavor in the classes in a lot of ways. But I, the classes also speak to like mechanics and what your cap character is capable of doing. Um, and so... <laughs> um, I this game definitely encourages multi-classing and I think that's kind of one of the fun components about it is uh, I want to make <laughs> I'm trying to make a game that encourages multi-classing and where I could see min-maxers being like ooh interesting let me try this out and find the exploit and having them struggle Because I think that's usually one of the dangers of multi-classing, right? And that's usually it's like, okay, you can multi-class in a lot of games, or you can take multiple paths, but then we're going to limit you, right? That's kind of, that's kind of usually the the how the design works out. Um, and so, if you were to take, for example, the assassin and the priest class, those are, uh, you know, you're not going to be as good, of course, as one who just goes priest or one who just goes assassin, but it kind of opens up your interests as a character and what you're capable of. Yeah, that that can certainly make sense. Now, that be that being said, do you cons do you consider this a game where you're going to be, where um, classes are more akin to archetypes, or is it a case where you're getting specific things each level, or is it a bit more freeform? <clears throat> the it's 
I think archetype is a pretty good word for it. Um, the right now, all that I have, I have classes, and then I have what's called elite classes, and I'm imagining the general classes of the game to be archetypals like assassin, priest, warrior, berserker, things where styles of combat, styles of fighting, styles of uh, character interest. Um, and then reflect competency and capability in those classes. But it's also kind of settings neutral. Um, that was kind of the goal of the classes, is to not having them be screaming at you, this is the setting of Shadow Quest, and if you're not playing uh, this setting, you're not going to be able to play this class. So that was one of the design goals with the classes as well, as I wanted them to be transferable to other settings. Mm -hmm. um, Within mind of, with the multi-classing feature, for example, um, one of the elite classes is if you take certain levels in Assassin, certain levels in Priest, you could be this Shadow Priest. Um, and that kind of relates to the setting more. So I'm imagining classes to be quite neutral, setting uh, vague, and then elite classes to be more setting specific. Okay, I can, I can certainly get that. Now, now, that br it's funny that you bring up 3.5 because I remember one of the issues I had with that was how th it was trying to do a skill system that was used in other games in a framework that just isn't designed to support that. Um, and yeah, there's the, there's been the whole training thing that started with um, Star Wars Saga Edition, it, but when it comes to the, do you, when it comes to the relationship between classes and skills, are you doing a case of um, diff, different amount of skill trainings? Are you doing it on a on a more divorced setup? How are you handling it? Um, well, in order to take a level in a class, you're going to have to have some requirement. And the two main equalizers of multi-classing is what I call a fighting score and a mystical score. So those are the kind of things that make it to where if you're taking a bunch of fighting classes and you're, you know, if you're a 10th level berserker, right, you're going to have a different capability, a different melee capability, um, or what the game calls clashes. You're going to be more competent and stronger with clashes than you would if you were a level one berserker, level five priest, because your fighting score would be different. So there's a different, there's, that's how I, the game is approached trying to balance it. Um, but in order to join a class, you will have to have some kind of um, capability. right? There's some, there is a requirement to take a first level in a class. And that's one way to kind of make it to where you can't just dip a little bit and take a little bit of everything. And even if you did do that, well, then you're going to be struggling with, uh, against the people who really focus on one thing. Now, when it comes to when it comes to um, the when it comes to the cla the um, actually, I'm gonna shift into the the magic question. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, anybody who has watched this channel for any amount of time, or just or just seen some of the shit posts that I put up that I've put up over the years knows. I have never, ever, 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 ever been a fan of the Vancian spells per day kind of magic system. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't like it when I started playing Black Box, playing Black Book A D and D, and that feeling has not changed. Mm hmm But I get the the way you said that, it gives me the vibe that you are not doing that particular magic system. No, I am not doing that particular magic system. I'm not. Uh, this is not. Let me clarify. This is not a D20 game, um, and even the character sheet that you're probably seeing uh, has been altered a little bit in its iteration into Shadow Quest of what it's really become. Honestly, I would say this past uh, recently, that's real. Everything is kind of crystallized for me um, in terms of what's going on and what direction is happening. But magic uh, <clears throat> from the beginning has kind of always been the same. I I don't know exactly what your position is on this, but I am not a huge fan of spell slots. I don't like energy depletion very much. 
Uh, so I came up with this kind of unique thing that, which I call the mystical score. Um, and it's, I connect it to attempting to use magic and increasing what you're trying to do. And the more you attempt it without kind of taking a rest or without kind of relaxing a little bit, um, it could lead to disasters. Uh, that's how, that's kind of the core theme of the use of of what I call supernatural in the game, mm -hmm. um, and I and I've, I've I've kind of struggled calling it magic or spells because uh, I I think the word supernatural seems to fit this kind of broad category of arcane, divine, uh, wild, or psionic magic or supernatural abilities that are that are in the game. So um, that's how I look at it. Like you have a certain threshold, like a rubber band of of capacity to interact with magic or mysticism or what have you. And if you push it too far, you're inviting disaster. Yeah. And I'm, per I'm perfectly f um, fine with that as long, so long as it's not a case where some, where, where people are eternally playing, um, playing conservative with it. Mm-hmm. What does that mean, conservative? Do you mean like they're not they're they're saving their big bang for the rainy day the... paradox is what it is what I call it. You okay, know, could you uh, explain that? Or if if I have to use something a bit more apropos, ninety nine mega elixirs. I can't use one of my ninety nine mega elixirs. What if I need it for later? He says while mm. going up against the final boss at the end of the damn story. Yeah, it's where I've actually because if you're that's one of the things I struggle with 5e in general, and I guess I suppose Dungeons and Dragons in general is that there was always a question of when do I do I do this now or do I save it for later? So is that kind of what you're speaking to, like the the trepidation that one has where it's like, okay, let's say I'm facing this monster, this beast, right? I have this ferocious beast in front of me, and then my character's like. But I don't want to use a fireball because what if there's another beast around the corner? Is that kind of what you're speaking to? Some somewhat, and it ju it just keeps on, it just keeps on going and keep and keep and keeps. <laughs> and then you go to bed, and then you're like, "Oh, I should I never used a fireball." Or you go whole campaigns where you're a mage who casts absolutely zero spells. Yeah, I um. Have you what is what's been your experience about how to avoid that in other games? What's the because I mean I think whenever you have in front of a player a uh, how do you say it like a buffet of options, right? Um, well, how do you motivate the player to use the big gun, right? Or even just anything more than the the simple the simple gun? I think you mo I think you motivate them. But by as far when it comes to using the when it comes to using the big gun by ma by making it so that so that they can use so that they can use the smaller gun without having to worry about if they're not if they're not gonna be able to get to get some use later like mm -hmm. the bit one of the big problems with the with say the Vancean model is that you have to wait a whole damn day. Or, or at the very least, get eight hours worth of rest in order to get your stuff back after it's been used. And just give, just giving people some degree of a of a parachute. In fourth edition, you had the whole thing of in, of at will encounter and daily powers. At wills you could use whenever you wanted. Encounters you could use once per encounter, and dailies you could use once per day. Obviously. Well, so here's how Shadow Quest is kind of addressing that issue because uh, magic works in what I would say two important ways. One is uh, it's conditional. So if you, uh, I don't have very many in Shadow Quest uh, spells where you or or even mystical abilities where you literally just create fire and and blow something up. Um, most spells are very conditional in terms of like if you want to pick up a fire and throw it at someone, you're going to have to fight, have a fire near you. Uh, 
so that's kind of one thing of looking at it is environmental conditions, which by having it around you maybe inspires player engagement more with what's going on instead of it being such an internal experience where the player's like, well, let me think about micromanaging my resources for future use. If you have in front of you this current uh, you know, burning building and you have the ability of, of pyromancy or controlling fire or shaping fire, um, throw it at them, right? Or move the flame in some way towards, uh, towards them. And of course, you know, you risk a disaster because it could blow up in your face. Mm -hmm. There's that component, which uh, I think engages players more is if it's environmentally conditional, which is one of the core components of how I'm looking at the use of the supernatural in Shadow Quest. And then the other component would be, I don't think a lot of games, particularly Dungeons and Dragons, I, I would speak to that more so, so maybe I shouldn't say a lot, because <laughs> you'll come at me with your knowledge. <laughs> but I would say Dungeons and Dragons in particular, the threat isn't there to propel the player to say, I'm going to expend this big gun because I could die. And I think... That, I'd say that's more of a failing of um, the CR method. Oh, uh, when it comes to okay. when it comes to encounters, I've I've never I wasn't a fan of I wasn't a fan of CR back in the day. Still not still not a fan because it relies on too many assumptions. Mm hmm. Yeah, and if there's good planning, you know, there that's that's kind of the big struggle. I guess that's a that's a reasonable response. Like a, it depends on the DM and how well they're creating threat and risk and danger yeah. for the players. Obviously, um, but usually kind of things you you can't really account for as a designer because every table is going to be different for sure the for issue sure. I've, I've often had is the assumption that you're that you're going to have a balanced party of four that's one hell of an assumption to make there's also the fact that there's not much in the way of guidance in terms of teaching gms to utilize monsters in a way that the, in a way that generates that synergy Mm -hmm. so they well, I thought that actually if that's one of the like, redeeming features of 4e I thought was how they had enemies kind of categorized in a way that was helpful to create scenarios pretty pretty much and setting up a kind of XP budget because um, mm -hmm. 4e didn't use CR it ha it had it had different variations of of, of various monsters, like there, there are three or four different variants of kobolds that filled different roles, and you'd have stuff, you'd have s some of the bigger stuff, like say solos, which were beefier because they were meant to be, well, a solo. They're meant to take on a whole party by themselves. <laughs> There's that MMO emulation going on there a little bit, yeah, yeah. But to that, yeah, I, to that, I say, whenever it comes to that, whenever it comes to that, I often, I often say. Why is why is taking notes from MMOs a problem? And I've never it's not that's an, that's not a criticism. That's just a neutral observation. Yeah. I'm not criticizing that. I'm just I'm just noticing that in the era of when 4E was created, that was also when MMOs were exploding. So that's well, that's that, I don't mean that as a criticism or a yeah. judgment. Um, and yeah. I I find that a lot of people who throw who throw the term MMO have no idea how MMO design works. Well, you're talking to someone who started off in the in Realm and EverQuest in Ultima Online, so I've I've been around MMOs uh, a while. Well, I, I, I certainly I I have I have as well, I have as well. I've even before even before I got into MMOs, I was messing around with muds. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But the claim. I, yeah, know, I think that's a fair point. You can't um, design a game for every table. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do think that Shadow Quest tries to make combat a little bit scarier with the injury system. Yeah, you're um, not, you... So if you go into a combat situation without armor, uh, you could have a problem depending on who you're fighting and what have you. So I think there's there's just ways of mitigating um, a hyper cautious player, um, and one of that is I think risk. But then also environmental conditions. That's kind of my my approach. Mm -hmm. But 
and I did I did notice that you're not you're doing a wound system. You're not really doing mm-hmm. HP in this in the same sense. You I hate hit points. I don't know what my problem is, but I have I got a problem. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm, Sorry, I interrupted. I'm, neut- I'm neutral on it, but it ultimately depends on execution. You have you have think you um the when I look at think when I look at say the resist setup or the whole fighting score and mystical score. Um, it makes me wonder if you're doubling down on ma- on managing resources. Mm. Uh, there's a little bit of resource management involved, um, but I have I I do have a some hit point component in the game in the form of composure. Uh, because for me, I was always confused about hit points and kind of health in general. Um, I, I know people can kind of role play however they want with that, uh, but I think mechanics help reflect realism, and they can kind of facilitate that engagement with the story. So uh, if you're injured, you're injured. That's kind of how Shadow Quest approaches it. You have follows what's called the three, two, one rule, which is you have three minor injuries, two lethal injuries, and one lasting injury. If you have a lasting injury, you're on basically death's door, and you need to get some help. And you can even potentially have, you know, uh, something that's going to last forever, like an eye gone or, you know, a leg gone or something along those lines. So the goal is definitely don't have a lasting injury uh, because you're going to struggle recovering that. But then there's also the composure component, which connects heavily to the clash system, which is the melee combat system in the game. And social mechanisms mm-hmm. uh yeah yeah i can certainly get that and one of the, one of the things that i did i did notice just looking at some of the um some of the class samples that you had sent is mm-hmm. each of each of the classes has some has some sort of um has some sort uh, has some sort of scale has some sort of scaling feature like the assassin has the assassin's mark, which scales as you level up. Ninja has ninjutsu. Um, Orator has speechcraft, and and so on. Is that something that is a is going to be a standard thing with each of the uh, classes? Yes, that's why. Uh, whether I know the working sheet I gave you is is pretty rough, um, but the it's going to be helpful to have whatever character sheet you have because most people are, I imagine will take multiple classes but um keeping track of what's called class talents Mm -hmm. that's going to be kind of an important part so when it comes to that resource management um i would say the things that hit the most with that would be your fighting score mystical score and then your class talents and then any random features you collect along the way that's Mm -hmm. pretty much it in a nutshell uh so um and it, it does keep it it doesn't get too unwieldy uh, in terms of how many of those you can have. Um, but yes, that is kind of the core design of every class. Not every class necessarily, but most classes will have some kind of talent that can be expended or used that kind of makes it reflect some kind of signature ability. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and when it comes to when it comes to backgrounds, I can see some similarity between this and the backgrounds that were in um, 5e. Okay. The, the, I, but I'd say the big thing is the fact that you can double or tr- or triple dip into backgrounds because it's on a rule of three points. Yeah. Yeah, the, the goal there was to kind of help players make a story quickly. Um, whether they're doing it randomly by rolling, or whether they're like, well, what if I was an aristocrat, and then I was, uh, you know, um, uh, an outlander for a while. And then I'm like, well, well, what happens then? How do you <laughs> how do you create that story? And so I came up with this kind of, what I think initially it might be a little overwhelming to look at, because it's like, how does this work? But then I think once you get the hang of it and just really look at it for a second, I think it becomes what I like to flatter myself and think intuitive. <laughs> but maybe I'm just biased. Um, but you start off with your origin, 
And then if you were to leave behind a background, you have a setback. And then if you were to go into another um, background, you know, that's, you're hooked into that background. And you could stay, and that could just be it, right? Or you could do a third one where you'd have a setback in that second background, and then you get hooked into that third one. And that way, you, and you, that's actually could come up pretty quickly. I mean, I think that you could even use like a website to generate um, that randomly. But you know, obviously, I'm looking. I'm using tables because I'm old school. But uh, I just really, I enjoyed the idea of thinking about well, what if I was a noble but also an artisan? Um, and so that's where that came from. Mm -hmm. And of, of course, there's also the fact that there's actual mechanical benefits instead of a situational heavy um, affair when it, came, when it came to the features of backgrounds or originally. Yeah, I, um, I, I really like the idea of knowing who your character is when the game starts, or at least having something to go off of for your character. Um, I know some people just prefer to just kind of be like, oh, I'm this stereotypical archetype, and, you know, that's that's good. Um, but I like the idea of really knowing who my characters are, but I know that's not for everyone. Um, so I like the idea, too, of how the backgrounds can say, well, if you just want to be a noble... That doesn't you don't suffer a consequence for just being a noble and not having this dynamic background or whatever this complicated backstory right sometimes it's just like nah bro i was just a blacksmith and my dad raised me to be a blacksmith and that's what's up mm -hmm. um and i think that should be rewarded and that's kind of why if you put all three points into the background there is kind of a um a little benefit to that and it's the each of those benefits are designed to be some kind of mix of flavor and mechanical advantage and when I look at when I look at the sheet when I look at the sheet, um, since you have re you have resist in the form of evasion, fortitude, and and willpower, that um, stuck around. Yep. Mm -hmm. Is it go is it going to be is it going to be a case where say where say evasion can be used when it comes to more more martial affairs, or is that mainly going to be used for dodging breath weapons and traps and the like? So the yeah the resists are responding to effects generally, um, and the, your evasion score actually is how you so the the default armor that you have if you're not wearing any armor then you 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 get what's called armorless defense mm -hmm. and that is equal to eight plus your evasion so the more evasive you are then the harder you are to hit from a ranged attack or something from far away. But melee is a whole different ball game uh, in Shadow Quest, and that's kind of one of the things I'm. That and the Shadow Quest feature is kind of one of the things I'm most excited about the game, is the melee clashes. Mm -hmm. That that certainly makes sense, since you're you're from what I from what I understand you're do, you're doing it as a clash system where both parties have to try have to try and roll higher. Are trying to roll higher than the other, instead of doing the a attack versus defense approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a clash is almost like uh, I use the metaphor of a, of like zo like a cinematic zoom in. So if you have the overall battlefield, when two creatures are clashing with each other in melee, um, and there's also going to be some design of clashes with uh, mysticism, but we'll save that for later. Uh, melee. Uh, clashes are kind of a zoomed in cinematic three round back and forth and it can be shorter because the stakes are pretty high um, and it is a you have a three dice that you can roll mm -hmm. and that what dice you're able to roll reflects how well you are in your fighting score and what weapon you have um, and those kind of things that's where the d4s d6s d8s d10s d12s come in come into play um, in in clashes and um, whether you're an attacker or a defender in a clash will kind of determine what die you have available to you based on your weapons as well. So if you are using a really heavy two-handed sword, you really do get a really high die for 
your attack during a clash, but only if you're the attacker, right? Um, so that kind of helps balance some things and also create some interesting, like, what can I do, what can't I do in the moment? Um, so, yeah, I'm really excited about clashes. The clashes also involve the composure element, right? Because um, kind of, that's kind of how I looked at hit points for a while in previous Dungeons & Dragons games and what have you. I was like, okay, so hit points are, what, like my morale? So if I'm like fighting somebody and they're you know swinging their weapon at me and they hit me, but obviously the DM isn't like, oh, your arm is cut. So in my mind, I'm like, okay, so my arm isn't cut. Nothing's physically hurt, but I lost hit points. And I'd like, be, I'd like can someone explain to me that? And they're like, oh, you're scared or something, right? Or like, so I'm like, okay, so my morale is affected. So in my head, I kind of split combat between the composure of a combatant and how well they're holding up and whether they're having an injury inflicted upon them. And that's where the concept of clashes came from. Mm -hmm. And I do recall seeing this idea of cinematic zoom in for for these clashes in, a, in not exactly the same format but in this in a similar direction in games like blade of the iron throne which is a oh. spiritual successor to riddle of steel okay yeah never played him um riddle of steel was trying to go for a bit more realism in term in terms of its combat setup without tr mm -hmm. without being as overwhelming as some of the as some of those more infamously crunchy affairs from the 90s yeah, that's that. Yeah, what's with the '90s? Whew, we were all about math back then, weren't we? <laughs> that's before new math. <laughs> I would say if I can't, I can't say why, but I'd, but um, let's let's keep in mind that a lot of the early generations of role players, um, were college students, and this idea of simulation and realism was in was in was intrinsic. Um, as well as well as a mm. lot of early people coming from the war gaming scene that is all about simulating historical battles when the war gaming mm -hmm. scene really blew up in the seventies. And I think, mm, I think I see. I think what ended up happening is people wanted to push towards more quote unquote realism. Mm -hmm. And Well with your Oh sorry, go ahead. Event and this is where you get stuff like everything that Fantasy Games Unlimited put out that just has these atrocious long skill lists oh yeah I, I can't handle that now admittedly this is this is me theorizing oh obviously I don't have first-hand knowledge about about that kind of thing there was also there's there's also the um, the fact that for a good amount of time a lot of games had very segregated types of types of mechanics. You know the idea of the D twenty system of this of this one this unifying mechanic that spreads out into everything else. That wasn't really that wasn't a thing for a good while. Mm -hmm. You know you had a like look at say A D and D. You've got sub you have subsystems for combat. You have subsystems for skill use. You have subsystems for magic use. You have all these di all these different setups. Some of them do involve the D the D twenty, but that same that same unification isn't present is what is what I'm getting at mm -hmm. oh and I'm this wasn't something that started with the d20 system in terms of unification it was our it was something that was already happening in the mid 90s because the that level of comp that level of complex realism had started to crumble under its own weight I would say too that that society took a turn towards that zoom in brutalness in our in our films, in our literature, in our art, because uh, like if you look at movies like Braveheart and even like Matrix, there is kind of like a brutalness of realism that is occurring throughout our society. So I could see how we would have this move towards like yet yeah, so like mechanics that justify this realism. And then it's almost like we're simulating reality in some ways. Also, um, I think there's also yeah. the fact that the that think that things like the Hayes Code had 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 um, di had died a very violent death with with the advent of New Hollywood. Um, mm -hmm. 
and in the case in the case of well comics by the, by the, by the 1980s the comics code authority was all but dead it was still around but so, but um but no but it had nowhere near the level of authority that it did that it did early on mm -hmm. oh, especially during the so especially since it in the case of comics it's reacting to the glorious stupidity that was the silver age where hey hey now <laughs> oh i'm i'm not i'm not disparaging i'm not that is not a disparagement on my part but you cannot deny that some of that some of those stories in the silver age were complete batshit no you can't deny that but i also think red sonia was good so red so red sonia wasn't silver age <laughs> No, I know, but I'm, I'm speaking to my taste. <laughs> That's what I'm speaking to. But speaking of, if I could ask you about your taste, based on my description of clashes and what you've seen about it, how, how does it how does it seem like a departure, if at all, from those other designs that you had um, um, spoke to? It's one. It's. I think the the main the main. Th the only th the only thing that I would be a bit concerned about is regarding the length, because if because if if it's this zoom if this this zoom in thing that's over several turns, that could be an issue because you could you could have a situation that's not far removed from the hacking problem that a lot of cyberpunk games have. Where yeah, it's it is three rounds, but the chances of it going to three rounds are very slim. So if you're lo if you are a defender and you're and you won. Uh, and this guy's gonna kick your butt. You should back away, because um, you, unless you're wearing armor, you have a significant and you lose composure. Uh, you could lose composure very, very quickly mm -hmm. within a round or two. So uh, you could get severely injured very quickly, especially if you're not wearing armor. That's gonna reduce. Let's say, let's say you have a giant hammer being hit hitting you. Let's say someone rushes at you with a giant hammer and they initiate a clash. Okay, that's the mechanical language there, initiating a clash. They get a D12 because they initiated the clash. Okay, mm -hmm. so if if especially if they have a high fighting score, they could seriously hurt you. If you have armor on, like full plate, that's going to help reduce some of that uh, blunt injury. Um, but you could seriously, seriously get hurt. So I think that's kind of one way I've tried to because I, I I looked at that too. I was like, well, three rounds. I mean, does anyone want to? Does the, do the other players want to wait three rounds for something that maybe doesn't have to do with them? Um, but because the options are very slim, you're attacker or you're a defender, and it's just like roll, roll, see what happens, roll, roll, see what happens, and then you don't really have many options uh, um, other than the die available to you. Yeah, I would adv I would advise setting up some sort of flowchart. For, for since this is going to be an unorthodox approach, because a lot of okay. people are a lot of people are going to be looking at combat with that same economy of actions, um, ve very very initi very initiative centric affair. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the yeah. way that's described is if you have to keep track of who's the attacker and defender, and then if the defender wins. The roll, the first round roll. If the defender wins, they can decide to be next round be the attacker, or they can just back off. And that's kind of basically it. Um, but you know, if you're losing, if you're losing composure, that could be a problem. Yeah, but I think that's a good suggestion. Some kind of a, a visual understanding of it. Yeah, and I think that's that's true for a lot of uh, RPGs. Is that Sometimes text alone just isn't quite enough, right? Kind of need that area <laughs> graphic of a cube and what have you, or that point of origin to really understand kind of visually what's taking place there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and that's ju that's just a that's there's of course there's of course the issue of hand of handling this kind of thing with um, right with ranged attacks or with or with magic, but I'd imagine those are going to be a bit sim a bit um, simpler as opposed to the clash system you have for melee versus melee. 
Yep, uh, melee. The melee clashes are restricted to melee. Mm -hmm. But if you're attacking someone with you know a bow and arrow on your turn, you're just making an aim skill roll against their defense, and that's it. Yeah. And then you could injure them or not. And that's another thing in the game is basically if you hit, you injure your injure someone. <laughs> So if, uh, and then the question comes up about well, how severe do you do you hurt someone? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now, when it comes to advancement, I did I did notice that advancement is basically get basically spending experience points. Um, is it going is it going to be a case where where um where pl are players going to have a, a set amount of experience points out of the gate that they could that they could spend, or is that not what's happening with um, Shadow Quest? No, uh, the they're they're not. It's not going to be like a World of Darkness to spend experience and and buy things. Or one tabletop I actually enjoyed a lot is Game of Thrones. Uh, the good one. I think there was two out there of Game of Thrones role playing games. There's two. There are. There was the there was the first one that was by Guardians of Order, which used the Tristat system, which was fine. Uh, and then there okay. then there was the one by Green Ronin, which when they lost the license was rebranded into Sword Chronicle and was folded uh, into yes. the Chronicle system. But Sword Chronicle is basically the game their Game of Thrones RPG in a legally distinct form. Oh, that's right. I, well, I had seen the PDF of where it was actually Game of Thrones, but then I do. Yeah, they rebranded it. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. It, they didn't even call it Game of Thrones until a bit into <laughs> it. They called it a Song of Ice and Fire role playing. And then when they oh, did shoot. A, um, when they did a revised version of the core book, they called that revised version Game of Thrones edition. Mm hmm. Uh, yeah, you're not really. Uh, you're. <sighs> The way that the character creation process is in Shadow Quest is you're going to be given some like uh, ways of growing your fighting score or your master score or your fighting score or your mystical score, and that's kind of what you need. That or a uh, skill being trained in a skill or not, and that's what you'll need to get entry into a class. Yeah. So you'll kind of have to consider well, what class do I want to be or not, and then how much do I want my character background to reflect that because I, I i think it's fair to say that if your background is uh i don't know like a bookkeeper basically like a scholar right if you're if you're just sitting there in books all day you're not going to take a level one in, in class uh, i'm sorry level one in assassin um as your class so there's got to be some connection some tether between your background your your character creation and the first level class that you're going to take um, however, when, um, experience is divided into different categories in Shadow Quest. There's general experience, um, and that's what you would ex how you'd expect to get that in terms of the GM, or, or as the game calls it, DM, because it's called the Disaster Master in Shadow Quest. If you want to get experience, the DM will hand it out to you as general experience. You can use that to train up a skill or take a level in a class. Um, but the other way to gain levels in a class that you have would be to declare a shadow quest. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to leveling up a class, is it a, is it a case where the amount of XP that's needed for each level is, st is um, standard? Yeah, 100 experience per level. Mm -hmm. so it's yep, it's just like a, just a fixed amount. Um, and the, the reason for that is the, I haven't quite crunched the numbers, but the quest system, which the DMs will have to consider, uh, the overall kind of objective of the parties and whether they complete something or however they want to hand out experience sessions versus, you know, achievements or what have you, or, uh, you know, accomplishments or something along those lines versus breaking it down in between mobs being killed or enemies being destroyed or whatever. Um, they, the bestiary is broken down between lesser, greater, and epic creatures or enemies. Um, and that kind of... So depending upon where the players are at, <coughs> excuse me, level-wise, that can kind of impact the experience gained. But 
it's pretty straightforward 100 experience per class. Mm -hmm. I can I can certainly get that. Now, with that with that said, um, I know that you're plan I know you're planning on put on putting the thing up on Kickstarter in the future. Do you have a mm -hmm. um estimated date as to when that kick when you're going to be doing it live? I know that there's a pre-launch page right now, but yeah, my goal is to get the uh, playtest put together a little bit more coherently. Um, and then I'm hoping to launch by uh, in the next couple months here. Um, I, you know, I've done a Kickstarter before. I learned it quite a bit. This, I kind of beat myself up over it before. Like, you know, why did I launch it so early? What the heck was I thinking? Uh, but then I remember when I was like a teenager and playing computer with my dad, whether we're playing EverQuest or something like that, or he has like a program to show me and, or he wanted me to figure something out, you know, electronically, you know, cause old people, I guess, struggle. Mm -hmm. um, how much I would just click around and go all over the place and I would mess up and like destroy the thing. And then I'd figure it out along the way. So like my troubleshooting, you know, approach is kind of how I process things and how I try to be successful. So um, I'm trying to take kind of what I've learned and apply it better and create a little bit more of a polish uh, and have something together before I launch. So I think that's kind of my strategy. Um, I got three sons. I have a nine-year-old, 11-year-old, and a, we'll be 13 soon. Um, so I want to make a video of us playing the game and kind of get that promotion out there and um, so I want to put some stuff together before I launch. Um, but I will definitely have the website being updated whenever I get the playtest together. I have the link for it up right now. It's just nothing's in it yet. <laughs> um, but I also want to get some more feedback from people, from the community. There's some really great playtesters out there, really great designers who give really substantial feedback and really help out. So I just want to make sure I have a good product before I ask people to, to spend money on it. I can, I can certainly get that. So with with that said, when it when it comes to a playtest version that's going to be out in the public, I'm guessing that's going to be on the site. When do you foresee that um, dropping? If you have an estimate, I am looking for probably mid April or late April, um, by the latest. Um, that's that's what I'm shooting for. I can, I can certainly get that, and that's pro I'm guessing that's going to be j just pre gens, the core rules, and a sample adventure. Um, it's gonna. I wouldn't say it's a sample adventure, but there's going to be a like I would call it a guided adventure. That's what I'm kind of calling it right now. <laughs> a tutorial um, adventure. Yeah, a way of basically being like, here's uh, some pre gen characters. Here is what a lot of things look like, how you can easily play the game. Here's a lot of um, mystic role spells. Here's some examples, disasters. Here are several classes to choose from. I have a, a lot of the material is done. Um, I just want to make sure it looks really good. So by the latest, I couldn't imagine it being after April. I'm, 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 I'm looking pretty good where we're at right now. So I'm definitely giving you a conservative estimate, but that, that's what I'm shooting for. Yeah. I can I can certainly get that, and I w I will be looking forward to seeing how to seeing how that develops. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. You're very welcome, and thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, I'll take a drink before I go to bed then. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, 
My name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.